Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I am Justin Nasiri, and my goal is to help members of the military community thrive in their post-service career and life. Today is episode number 407, Making a New Ketchup. That's True Made Foods with Abraham K. Mark. I sell ketchup, right? So I make and sell ketchup and barbecue sauce. So we are a healthy food company, True Made Foods, you know, with the mission of trying to make American food healthy. We want to turn junk foods into superfoods. So we started with ketchup. Well, I'm really grateful for uh, Steve Bain for many reasons, but in today's episode, I'm grateful because he tracked down Abe and got us connected for today's interview. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I'll kind of rattle off because we just wrapped it up, rattle off a couple things. But most of all, it is Abe's honesty, his directness on just revealing the ups and downs of entrepreneurship, as well as the many pivots that he's experienced in his own life. I'll share that he started True Made Foods six to seven years ago. Ago when he was 38, he had four kids. It was not necessarily in line with what he did in his background, and he is now, you know, the official catch-up in Red Sox at the Red Sox Stadium in the Nationals. They are growing rapidly. They were named. We didn't even talk about this on the interview, but they were named one of the top 10 most innovative food companies of 2021. But in this interview, things to keep an ear out for. I appreciated how he talked about how most people get jobs through their network, not the front door, and when you leave the military, you're almost starting with an empty network. He talks about how big name degrees at big schools don't solve everything. He talks about going to Bulgaria and taking over a plastics company to do turnaround work and how that sort of forward deployed work, investing in building companies in emerging markets, it almost seems like he was scratching an itch that started in the military as a naval aviator and then continued afterwards for a good stretch. He talks about how his four kids eating ketchup, he couldn't get them to stop, so he wanted to address a problem around his table. He talks about an entrepreneur entrepreneurship blocking and tackling and really avoiding the trick moves that can be distracting and all the ways that you have to say no. I love what he shares about saying no to growth and really being honest about when you're ready to grow. I haven't heard that much and I wish I heard it more about entrepreneurship. And so as always at beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find show notes with links to everything we discuss, including Doha Delivery, a company that he started, and more importantly to True Made Foods, which is at truemadefoods.com. So with that, let's dive into my conversation with Abe. Joining me today in Alexandria, Virginia, my guest is Abe Kmark. Abe, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Justin, thanks. Thanks for having me. Really, it's an honor to be here. So I'm going to make space for you to, to introduce yourself. Vanderbilt, London Business School, Naval Aviator. Uh, what do you want listeners to know about your background, both in and out of the military? I always say my background is not that important, but we all go through these different phases in our lives. And I think you just need to realize that it's totally okay to keep evolving and changing and switching roles. And the plan that you had or that you thought you had may not be the plan that worked out, but it works out really well in the end sometimes as long as you keep be a good person and keep working hard. So not to say, and a little bit of luck helps along the way too. We'll work backwards eventually, but let's start with what you have done for the last almost six and a half, seven years now. You run a company called True Made Foods. So let's set context. If you ran into a fellow naval aviator on the street and they're like, man, Abe, what do you do for a living now? How do you explain what you do with True Made? I sell ketchup, right? So I make and sell ketchup and barbecue sauce. So we are a healthy food company, True Made Foods, you know, with the mission of trying to make American food healthy. We wanted to uh, turn junk foods into superfoods. So we started with ketchup, barbecue sauce, and sriracha, and now we have mustards and other hot sauces. And we, what we do is we take out all the added sugars and junk, and we add uh, real veggies instead, cook these things naturally like they were meant to be. So no added sugars, tons of extra nutrition, turning these once sugar-laden, empty-calorie foods into nutrient-dense paleo superfoods that kids love. So 
the audio book I'm listening to right now is Scott Jurek, who's one of the very successful ultra runners. And the book is called Eat and Run, and it's just as much about food as it is about running. But it's just very, very top of mind for me realizing what we put in our bodies and how that's the gasoline, the fuel that's driving us. And we put a lot of garbage in. And ketchup, I never realized until in the last couple of years, like most ketchup I grew up on is just extremely sugary. There's like a lot of sugar added to these things. Yeah, and the food industry has done a terrible thing where they've pushed the whole idea of a calorie as a calorie and the whole concept that the burger is worse for you than anything else. And really, the ketchup that you're putting on your burger or your hot dog is the worst part of that entire meal. The bun is a short second, but that ketchup is straight sugar, especially if you're using conventional ketchup that you would get at a restaurant or a typical ballpark. You're getting two-thirds corn syrup. It's got more sugar per serving than ice cream. A tablespoon of ketchup has about the same amount of sugar as a chocolate chip cookie. So you're literally just putting ketchup in an ounce of ketchup has 6.2 ounces of uh, 6.2 grams of sugar. So it's like putting a couple of teaspoons of sugar right on your burger or right on your, might as well be pouring candy on your hot dog. It really is the worst thing. And especially because most conventional ketchup is fructose. I mean, the sucrose isn't that much better for you, but it's not better for you. But fructose is just that much worse, right? It's high fructose corn syrup and corn syrup in conventional ketchup. And that's what you're pouring on. It's the worst thing possible for you. And the worst part is it is. And the reason I got into this is because it's mostly consumed by kids. I mean, if you're an adult sitting at home, you're like, well, I don't need ketchup that much. All right. But if you're a parent, you see how much ketchup gets consumed. Um, it's a scary amount. To put it into a larger context, there's about a quarter pound of refined sugar in a 20-ounce bottle of ketchup, which is a standard size, you know, Heinz or private label ketchup or even organic ketchup. And that's the same amount of sugar that's in a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. So if you're a family that's going through a bottle of ketchup every month, your family is basically eating the equivalent of a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts a month through that ketchup. And it's those things that add up and they're really the big problem with our diet in general that we need to fix. We don't need to get rid of hamburgers per se. We just need to make them better. Go back to how they were raised before, you know, grass fed, regenerative agriculture and real ingredients and then get rid of that nasty corn syrup that we're pouring on top of it. That's how we create a diet without major sacrifice, right? You have major, that's an 80 20 improvement right there, you know? And as a parent, that was my motivation for starting a company. We'll get into the origin story, but you know, as you look back on your life, at what point did the food you were eating, like, have you always been really conscious of what you're putting in your body? And if not, what was the changing point for you being more mindful about how you were fueling yourself? Yeah, I mean, no, I wasn't always that mindful about it. I was lucky that I was raised on a pretty good diet. Like, my parents did let us have soda when we went out to restaurants or places like that, but we never had it at home. And we basically ate home-cooked meals most of the time. My mom's Italian. She was a really good cook. We ate home-cooked meals most of the time, lots of fruits and veggies, lots of vegetables, salad with every meal. We always made our own salad dressing. I learned to cook two ways. One was helping my mom make pasta sauces, and two was, as the oldest child, I was always in charge of making the salad and salad dressing, so I'd cook. We made our own salad dressing. We would never, ever buy salad dressing. Then you taste like a bottled salad dressing. You like you want to throw up after needing like a homemade salad dressing for so long, and that kind of helped prime my palate for something better. Now, I also grew up in the 80s where everything was bad. We definitely ate some bad food. My mom would buy rice cakes trying to be healthy, and now we know rice cakes are terrible for you. And juice, too. She would feed us juice, and juice is obviously awful. It's all fructose, which is the worst thing for you. So I learned more as I got older in my 20s when I was in the Navy, just starting to learn more about it. I had a roommate and his girlfriend who had very much more Anglo kind of diets that they grew up on, that standard, very much more standard American diet. And they were constantly struggling with their weight. And they were my roommate in the Navy. And they would get on me for cooking all my food in olive oil like crazy. Like I'd buy big multi-gallon things and go through it in a month, even in my 20s. And they were like, oh, so many calories, extra calories, so bad for you. And I was like, this pasta can't pasta, olive oil cannot possibly be bad for you, right? Like I just had this deep, dark feeling. Something from my Mediterranean roots was telling me this has to be wrong. And so that's when I started doing some more research. I bought a book by Harvard Medical. I guess the Harvard Medical Group put out a better book early on in the late 90s, early 2000s that really started to expose sugar and refined carbohydrates as the problem. And so it was a slow evolution from there where I started to realize and start to cut things out of my diet. And then obviously through my 30s and 40s and as I had kids, 
in my 30s, I really started to get more and more serious about this. And so it's been a full on evolution because there's new information coming out all the time and just become better educated all the time. So we learn something new every day. But yeah, it's been a 20 year evolution where we've been just kind of taking that kind of Mediterranean diet base that I grew up with, uh, kind of a mix of a Mediterranean Southern, because my dad's Southern culinary influences, really Southern Virginia. So mix of that and like growing up with that and realizing that sugar is the ultimate problem. Yeah, and one of the reasons I got into the food business, too, because I was so frustrated with the natural food industry where they would just greenwash everything and make everything non-GMO or organic and think that saying an all-natural label was healthy when it's still loaded with sugar. All natural does not mean healthy if it's loaded with sugar. And now you're seeing the same thing with gluten-free or vegan, plant-based especially, is because that's where all the money is right now from BC. So you see all this hype about it. And you're seeing tons of that stuff just loaded with sugar or pro- highly processed and refined foods. That's really the problem. Plant-based and vegan is great. It's a wonderful diet if you want to follow it. But just realize that Oreos are considered plant-based. And that's obviously not healthy. Before we rewind the clock a little bit, what could you share with listeners to give them a sense of where you're at as a company? It's six and a half years in. I don't know if you view that in terms of headcount or money raised or distribution, but just give them a sense of the scale that you're at today. The first couple of years was like up and down, crazy, almost failing constantly, getting a lot of things wrong, making tons of mistakes. And then really in 2018 is really when we start to hit our stride and figure things out. We started with a low sugar ketchup early on. We just had a half sugar protect typical ketchup and then we got to a no sugar ketchup in 2018. And my co-founder is now the Ed and Ryan Mitchell, the legendary pitmasters from North Carolina. Ed's also a vet. He's a Vietnam veteran. That's really when things started to click. And I would say, I mean, sales as a consumer product, you're always just judged on one metric and that's your sales. And so we're at a $3 million run rate or trailing 12 months right now. So our last 12 months, we've made over $3 million in sales, and it's growing at 100% year on year. So that's where we are right now. We're not over 5,000 stores right now, hoping to be at 10,000 at this time next year and expanding into food service. So That's great. And even for myself, but I think for listeners too, it's it's just helpful to understand the metrics that are driving a company like yours and the, the run rate, the year over year growth, the number of stores. So one of the things I really liked about what you said in your introduction is the sense I got was giving listeners permission to reinvent themselves and kind of rediscover their identity. And I'd love to just kind of walk through, I'm guessing, you know, I don't know you, I'm guessing you had an identity as naval aviator. Could you just kind of walk us through the identity shifts that you've had starting with that one up until now? Because I know that you've had a varied career up until starting TrueMade. Yeah, I don't come from like a Navy family or anything like that. My grandfather was obviously served in the military because it was World War II, but my parents didn't. My dad was a conscientious objector during Vietnam. So I wasn't raised in a military environment. So when I went in and wanted to go in, I didn't have any direction or any type of understanding of what kind of your career looks like or what you're supposed to do with it. So I just kind of listened to other people and went along the way. And it was one of those things where I was like, when I was in flight school and primary in Corpus Christi, And I saw that lieutenants were there as instructors. I was like, oh, so after my operational duty, I'll come back here and be an instructor. That's what you do. And then I went to HTs, the helicopter training in Pensacola, and I saw guys there and they said, oh, this is a better job if you're a helicopter pilot. And so I was like, oh, okay, so I'll come back to Whiting Field. That's where we go. And then I got my, signed my squadron and I went to the FRS, the RAG, as they call it, where you learn your aircraft. You actually learn the aircraft that you're going to fly in the Navy. And after you get winged, and that was in Mayport, Florida, Jacksonville, then the instructors there were like, no, if you're a top pilot, you come back to the FRS. So I was like, okay, so I'm just, I'll be in Jacksonville Beach for a while. So I bought a house there and stuff. And then you deploy a couple of times, you learn more about the Navy and more things open up and opportunities. And one of the things that got me was I joined the Navy to deploy. I'm not saying I always wanted to be on the ship all the time, but I joined because I wanted to be out there. I wanted to be doing things. And especially after September 11th happened, Literally my first couple of weeks in the squadron, in the active duty squadron. And I really just wanted to be a part of things. I wanted to be out there. And so after I did multiple tours, I must have spent over 18 months at sea. After my aircraft commander tour, we were, we were part of a strike force in the Gulf, but for the Iraq war for OIF. We were the second strike group there after the Lincoln. We were the Enterprise strike group. Then I came back. We surged again after we came back. They sent us back out. I think naval forces just wanted to prove that they could deploy multiple times. This was the beginning of the Iraq War, and everybody was posturing about how much deployment we needed to do. So we deployed back out, but we only went to Europe, which was a nice two months. But, you know, we went back out. And then 
this time I was short. I was only had a couple months left in the squadron and I was back at sea again as an aircraft commander, as a maintenance officer for the cadet at the Bravo's lamps. And I was trying to figure out what to do next. And I just wanted to kind of stay forward deployed. So I was looking for things overseas or part of commands that would keep me kind of involved. So I only looked at billets overseas at that point. And I was looking at insular Turkey with NATO. I was looking at a signal. I also started realizing after deploying that you could, for your shore duty, you could go like anywhere as a Navy thing. This was kind of like your one freebie after your first operational tour as a junior officer. This was your chance to go out and really see some other parts of the military. You know, so I asked to do everything and I was again multiple different billets overseas. I even tried to get a temporary billet with UN forces in Ethiopia because I thought that sounded cool. And I was just trying to get out there and do something. And then my wife, who was my girlfriend slash fiance at the time, that was changing at that moment. She was a surface warfare officer and she was getting out. So she was short time and she wanted to get a grad degree in economics. So she wanted to go to the London School of Economics and was applying to the London School of Economics. So I asked my skipper if he could get me into London. And he said Navier was just shutting down in London at the time, which was a sweet deal. But he was like, or because they were moving to Naples. But he was like, we can't get you Navier, but we can get you someplace close. It's called Jack Molesworth. And I was like, who is Jack Molesworth? And it's Joint Analysis Center Molesworth, which is the Joint Analysis Center for U.S. European Command. And it's in UK at RAF Molesworth. So I was like, sounds interesting. Let's do it. And next thing you know, I had orders to an intel base where I was literally the only aviator on the base. I think there was one other army aviator on the entire base and everybody, almost everybody else was a intel officer. And so I had to get a TSSCI clearance with multiple other letters behind it, like HG. It's all kinds of stuff. Everything but Q, I think. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that made me a bad joke. So that was a great experience there because I really got to learn a lot. You know, I worked in deployments, so I got to go to Africa. I was in Africa, a bunch of places. We were in Kosovo and in Sarajevo. I got to go to Turkey, all kinds of places, helping support operations there. And then we got to work in counterterrorism, too. So I basically throughout my naval career, like things keep opening up to like see new concepts and ideas and other branches and working joint and seeing what else was out there, what else you could do. And that actually in some way actually ended up making me want to get out because for two things. One, I started getting my MBA at the same time, too. I did started doing my executive MBA at London Business School while I was stationed there. So I was doing that on nights and weekends. And that was opening me up to all new opportunities, too, of things that you could do. So I was kind of overwhelmed and excited by everything that could happen that I could get involved in. And I started to look at my Navy career. And as an officer, I really thought, you know, you kind of peak as a senior JO. That's probably when you're the best. You get the most flying time in after your second tour, too, especially you're one of the most senior, most experienced pilots in the squadron. And I was thinking, okay, I get to go back as a department head. And if I'm lucky and I select, I'll get to go back as a skipper, as an XOCO tour. And then after that, it's mostly desk jobs. And the one thing I saw about you working with U.S. European Command, I got to work pretty high up and work with the O6s and generals sometimes on certain things, is like I really hated working at the strategic level with the military because it was PowerPoints and political infighting and budget arguments and things like that. You know, we're at war and everybody's trying to fight for their own turf and budget, things like this. So it was really keeping things. And when I worked in counterterrorism, it felt like we were arguing with other parts of branches who were doing counterterrorism analysis more than we were focusing on the problem, right? So I was like, I don't like this trajectory that I'm on. Business school is opening up my ideas to all kinds of amazing opportunities that could be out there for me. I really don't know what I want to do in the private sector. I really had no idea. But I know that there just seems like a wealth of opportunity out there. And I was like a kid at a candy store just thinking. The other problem was that this was like between 2004 and 2007 that I was doing this. And so the economy was just exploding, right? And London especially was just on fire and everybody was making so much money. And there's so much opportunity in private equity and venture capital and banking and real estate. And I was thinking there's so much opportunity, so many cool things to do. I could get out. And so I made my choice and decided to get out. And unfortunately, my last day in the Navy was December 31st, 2007. And going into 2008, my wife and I decided that we were going to live in London, which was the epicenter of the financial crisis. So it was 
Often we were not well prepared. I didn't have a job lined up outside when I got out. We just thought that between the MBA and our grad degrees, my wife had just graduated with a master's in public policy and economics from London School of Economics. And we thought with the network there and with everything, with our grad degrees and our military backgrounds, we should be able to find a job pretty easily. That seemed to always be the narrative that you were given before. And I think I probably also had some unearned white person optimism that I got from my parents being white baby boomers growing up. They never really had to worry about anything. They were always taught, oh, yeah, you get a really good degree, you get a good job, you go on, things like that. And you know, the financial crisis really laid bare that that just really wasn't true, right? And I also faced what I think is the biggest hurdle to military members getting out. There's a couple of hurdles, but the biggest one is we have no network getting out. Really, it takes a long time in business to realize how much most people get jobs based on their network. And you don't realize that very few people go through the application and the actual interview process and things like that. That's only when people are really desperate to find when job markets are a little bit tighter. It really does come down to your network and in the military. You have almost no network outside. I think if I had gone to a full time business school program, I could have taken more time and focused on that. But because I was doing part time doing an executive MBA, it was really hard for me. So there was something that I was just totally left bare. And so we were left stuck without jobs with student loan debt. Our first son was born. We got pregnant with our second wondering how the hell we were going to survive in London where the pound was two to one against a dollar at the time too and our all our savings was in dollars. So we did consulting work. We scribbed that some friends of ours was they were able to get us some work, you know, here and there, some consulting. And then we lasted in London for about seven months. And then my wife moved six months maybe and then my wife moved home she moved in with my parents and had my second son there where they were living in Massachusetts at the time. And I took a job in Bulgaria actually, to go flip a plastics factory. So but that's a whole other story. Yeah, so I just took what I realized was like emerging markets is where I needed to go. And my first job was kind of like a deployment because two weeks after my second son was born, I left and went and lived in a small town in Bulgaria in a $10 a night hotel room next to a factory to work on turning this unprofitable factory around, which was a great experience. But it was drastic and very different from the flashy life that I imagined would happen after going to a big name business school. But you also realize that education is great and I think everybody should go after education and things like this, but it really doesn't just open doors automatically anymore. We were taught that, especially white people with white baby boomer parents who went to liberal arts colleges, things like that. They grow up teaching you that you get to go to a good school and you're going to be set for life like that. And it's really not the case. I don't think it's the case anymore. It definitely helps, I'm sure. But still, it's a whole new world out there. And people need to be a little bit more prepared for that. I love hearing that story. And I love the things I had written down about the network, how you kind of start out with a clean slate network when you leave the military and how vital that is and how the big name degrees at big name schools don't solve everything. When you look back on your time in Bulgaria, was that like a formative brick of knowledge that has played a role in, I'm trying to figure out if I'm like overly cinderella in your story of like, did that play into what you do at TrueMate or was it not really a vital component of your knowledge? I always say the Bulgaria experience was kind of like a finishing school for the MBA because I literally took over a factory with 50 employees and about a million euro in revenue that was unprofitable and having all kinds of problems. And only three other people at the entire factory spoke English. And of course, I didn't speak Bulgarian. So I was trying to take lessons, but it's not, it doesn't come overnight. And I really got to see kind of, cause you, anytime you're in an academic environment, there's like some great knowledge being passed on and then a lot of fluff too. And a lot of stuff that sounds good in the classroom is just a lot harder to implement on the ground. And I think that sense of realism and what really works and what doesn't really helped me a lot. And I was able to, number one, something like financial modeling, because I was in the P&L all the time and I was constantly doing models. And that just honed my skill because I was doing that every day, trying to figure out to make sure, you know, managing cash, seeing what we were going to do, how much money did we need from a bank or from an investor to kind of get it to the next level, to turn the company around and figuring out the key hinges of the model that we needed to really increase profitability. So... Figuring out the business model and just living in it day in and day out was critical. And then handling the people day in and day out and making sure people whose jobs, they could be fired because we were always on the threat of going out of business. Trying to keep people motivated without lying to them was critical, too. And I think that was something that was really important for entrepreneurship, too. When you're starting a new company, 
you really don't know what's going to happen. And you got to sell this vision to everybody around you to get people bought in to get, because everybody working at a startup needs to be hungry. They need to be excited. They can't be doing it for a paycheck. And you need those types of people, but they need to be buying into the vision of what could be, but you need to sell that. I think honestly, because there's a lot of startup founders who sell the vision really well, but aren't honest enough about it. And you need to be also honest about it at the same time, right? You need to balance that. You gotta sell the vision, you gotta sell them where we could be without being overly rosy about the situation, still being realistic. And I think that comes from being a parent too. I got four kids again, which is why I started the company because my kids were eating ketchup and I couldn't get them to stop. So I made a better one. But with the kids too, you want them to know that it's your hard work that gets you where you're going to be. Your hard work gets you a good math grade. It's not luck or skill or anything like that. And so it's the same thing. Thing when you're a startup, you need to be talking to your employees that like if we keep grinding out every day and just focusing on doing a good job every day, things will work out. There's a slight chance that we get hit with something awful that puts the company out. But as long as we're grinding out the best we can, that's the best chance that we have of turning this vision into reality. I love that. I want to get into the origin of, you touched on it there. I want to hear the full story there. But one thing I just want to, I know we're glossing over quite a bit, but from an external standpoint, I see you've got Mandalay Ventures. You'd spend time in Doha, Qatar. You do Coexist Foundation, and it's working in post-conflict areas. So I start to see this story of, okay, in my mind, I'm like, okay, Abe is the guy who gets stuff done in overseas areas, or he takes on these hard projects and turnarounds then i see true made pop up and i'm like oh man that's like a completely different pivot right yeah yeah like it's a really big pivot and so I, i'm curious to learn about where the idea came from you talked about with your kids but more importantly where the gumption came to like hard right turn in a career and starting something from scratch on your own yeah, I mean, I think what happened is, you know, right after the military, I still kind of wanted to be forward deployed, if you, you know what I mean. And so I love the idea of working in emerging markets and development, but I wanted to put my business degree to use too. And I wanted to be investing and building and building economies in emerging markets. I went through this whole thing where I was like, okay, I saw what was happening in Iraq. Maybe government, military intervention isn't working really well. Maybe economic intervention works better for development. Like I want to be that guy who helps build businesses and new startups and places. So after Bulgaria, that's what I did. I founded Mendeleo Ventures, which we made money by getting grants and doing consulting work in that area, trying to start new businesses for doing advice in that. And I also used some of that money then to try to, when we moved to the Middle East, we tried to use some of that money then to start fun startups. I created this old website, Google Doha Delivery. That's still our website, dohadelivery.com, doha-delivery.com, which was like an early seamless web or grub hub for Doha when there was nothing. I was doing all that kind of stuff because I really wanted to see an impact. I wanted to build something. And I liked that idea of being forward deploy, helping people, turning things around. I think, though, after years of doing that and having limited success, we had some great success, and, but nothing like gigantic. Like I just kind of got burnt out on those things. And we got burnt out living overseas. Doha was great. We have great friends there. I'm really glad we did that. My daughter was born there, but it was, you know, dangerous and, and not dangerous from like a military or like a terrorism standpoint. It's dangerous just from like your house could burn down any second because the construction is so bad and the driving is insane. A cement truck or a crazy land cruiser could run you off the road into a ditch like or slam into you. The driving was out of control. Houses and buildings were catching on fire all the time because everything was being built so cheaply and so quickly without any regulation. And you started to realize that if you really want to work hard and do something well, these types of environments aren't good if you want to do something honestly. So you started to learn actually like how important government is. And I think we take it for granted in the United States because we don't even see most of what our government does. And we just complain about it all the time. But work in some of these other countries I've worked in between uh, Lebanon and Egypt, Qatar and all the other Gulf countries and China and Africa. We were in Ghana a lot and Uganda. And when you see the absence of or real corruption, you complain about it, but it's nothing like what other countries are experiencing. When you see that and you realize how much harder it is to start a business or manage a business, and you see that's what's really preventing business from growing or economies from flourishing in these countries. Because it's so much harder to be an entrepreneur in some place like Ghana or Doha or Beijing or Beirut. So we decided to move back and I thought I found the perfect job with the charity coexist because they wanted to launch products from post-conflict areas. So 
I got to be kind of entrepreneurial with while getting a steady salary and providing a better stable life for my family in Northern Virginia. And that was fantastic. And I got all excited because we were launching a coffee from Eastern Uganda. And I was the guy who they would send over to work with the cooperative to secure the coffee and bring it back and figure out how to get it roasted and stored and get it onto shelves. So that was great. And we just started to make money with the coffee and then the charity ran out of money and I got let go. (laughs) So... That was just like one of these disillusioning moments. And I was just like, okay, I'm done. And that's where I decided to start my own company. And working in the coffee, I had been introduced to seeing what was happening in the food industry. And the food industry and the healthy food industry, natural food industry was really exploding at the time. This was like 2014, 2013, 14, 15. So there was a lot of VC money pouring in. There was a lot of M&A happening. You could see the shift. Every single headline was that millennials were killing this and millennials were killing that by the new consumer taste with better consumer taste movement towards healthier natural foods. And so that was exciting for me. And having been on that journey for the past 20 years of like learning more about food and getting more into it and about health and cutting out refined sugars, this just kind of all merged into one. And also we just had our fourth child in 2014. So I was kind of done traveling overseas and taking long trips away from the family and was just much more interested about doing something instead of trying to solve problems in every other country, I decided maybe I'll just try to solve something. My own problem, my own dinner table. And I think one of the problems I had in my 30s, you know, post-military was that I just really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I tried to do something of everything. And that's why I was jumping around all over the place. And I think by this point, I was in my late 30s when I started True Made Foods. And I was just ready to just do one thing and just do it really, really well. And I had no desire to try to get distracted by, and I think that's what you need as an entrepreneur. And one of my challenges when I was a young entrepreneur was like, I was always easily distracted by the newest, the shiniest, cool thing. And you really, really don't want that. And when you're starting a company, you just got to go full in and just be an expert on that company and be completely focused on it. And by this point with the four kids and everything like this, I had no bandwidth or environment to be distracted by anything else. Didn't care about learning about anything else except for my own business right now and just wanted to focus on building that. So that's kind of the evolution. How old were you when you started? I was 38. Okay. So I'm 44 now. I love so much about what you're saying and I love this singular focus. It is something I struggle with as well as an entrepreneur. It's very easy to be distracted. And what has helped you stay just fixated on the one thing that you're doing? And I know that's a simplification because there's not one thing you're doing. There's probably a thousand things related to what you're doing. But like what kind of keeps you focused myopically on that? I go back to something I learned in aviation, which was in naval aviation, you're constantly overwhelmed with tons of different inputs and things that you're supposed to be doing, and you need to be focused all the time, especially when there's some type of emergency happening. So they teach you, like, if an emergency is happening in the aircraft, aviate, navigate, communicate, right? Just remember the Those three things are doing those orders. So keep the aircraft in the air, focus on that first, then figure out where the hell you're going, you know, back on track, and then use your radios, use your comms, talk to people, and then communicate what's happening. And when you're starting a startup, especially if you've got a family, you're just in constant crisis mode. It's like you're in an emergency. Your aircraft's constantly crashing, and you're trying to figure out how to save it all the time. And so I just tell myself, if this is not something that is keeping the business afloat, don't get distracted. Don't get distracted by shiny objects. And it's hard when you're the founder, I've found, you have to kill good idea fairies all the time, right? Because your investors and people, everybody else is coming to you with good ideas all the time. Because everybody wants to come up to you and be like, you know what would be great? for your business. You know what you should do. You should get into McDonald's. If you were had your ketchup in McDonald's, that'd be, I'm like, yes, that would be amazing. I think that's great. Or you need to just start doing videos on TikTok. Just do videos on TikTok. Not on TikTok. I'm like, yes, that would be great. It would be helpful for us, but I don't have time to do videos on TikTok. I'm not a videographer. Right? Those things are usually not really good. And like at some point we will have enough money, spare money, and we can focus on that. And somebody will help us make videos for TikTok and we'll do that. But right now it's not going to drive our business. We have product in store. We have a method for making sure that that product sells that works like for through coupons and internal promotions, you know, things we do. So we just have to focus on blocking and tackling at the end of time and keep the trick plays to a minimum. Early on, I think you're constantly distracted by like wanting to grow too far too fast. And I think in the first couple of years, I made those mistakes too. And I learned my lessons. So now if somebody comes to me trying to sell me and the second you start a company, I guarantee you people are trying to sell you things. 
weirdest thing. Like you're trying to sell your product or your service, whatever it is, and everybody else is like flooding you with things to sell. So you need to learn to tune those things out. Nobody can turn your company around overnight. They all promise it. Things like this. It's a marathon, not a sprint. You just got to keep making product and keep building out incrementally and good things will happen. Things open up. You want to build that baseline, that foundation of your business first. You don't want to grow overnight. And I think you want to just be careful of that. But it's highly tempting, right? Because the first year I didn't take a salary. We went through a lot of our savings. Next four years, I took like a very measly salary, which was very difficult for us to get by on as a family. So you're just like desperate. You're dying. You want something to click and to just take off and things to be there overnight. And then if you really think about it, all right, well, we wouldn't have the inventory. We wouldn't even have the working capital to keep up with the demand if that, you know, help hurt. And the product would probably be, if we rushed it too hard, the product would probably be made poorly and we would sacrifice quality and then we would, you know, do we want if that 10 at one point I was thinking, do I don't want 10,000 people going to my website? It's not very good yet. Like we need to create a better website. We have a good holder. Great. Like up until January this year, we launched our current website thinking we had a decent website, but nothing that was amazing. Like that I really want people going to. When I want 20,000 people looking at our website and figuring, learning more about our product, I want a better images, a better story. Same with product on shelves. We went into a couple of big stores early on that we weren't ready for. We hadn't tested the product out. The product I knew was good, but the packaging was bad. The design, the price point was all wrong. So it took some time to get that right. And then I had to learn to start saying no until we got the right packaging. Now I'm confident that like the timing is right. The market is right. The packaging is right. So if we go into, if we launch Publix next year and we get into all 1100 public stores, like it with our catch up, like I feel confident that the product will perform pretty well, that we won't get kicked out in eight months because we've done enough now. We figured it out. And so that's the point that you need to get to. And the problem is it's really hard as an entrepreneur to tell yourself to hold back and be like, we're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. This is not part of the plan yet because you just want growth so bad and you need to hold back on that. And that I think that's something I've learned with age and just the patience I've learned with age, things like that too. And it took some time, but it was helpful. Part of it is that like, I'm lucky I don't have the energy I did when I was in my thirties. I mean, I still have a lot of energy. Thank God, or I would be able to do this. But when I was in my thirties, I was just insane. I could go all night working on projects. And I think it's uh, important now that I don't because it, makes me focus more on what's important. Totally. 100% agree with that. No, I love that. I have a two and a half year old son and I feel like already that where it's just kind of, I know the time I had in my twenties and thirties, I would have gone down rabbit holes that didn't matter. And I believe I'm sharpening a skill of ruthless prioritization, but I really respect the patience that you're talking about there. It's very, very difficult, especially when you have so many people evaluating you, investors, customers, partners, family members on growth. It takes determination to turn down all of the human growth hormone equivalents of growth for a company and really being honest, too, of like, okay, our packaging isn't ready. And I really respect that. I know we only have a few minutes left here. A lot we'll skip over, but I know that you've signed some big deals with professional sports franchises. I'd love to just kind of learn about anything you learned from that experience. Yeah, I mean, I think that was putting us against our comfort zone. That was one of the situations, just like we explained, like, should we do this? Because actually what happened is in late 2019, the Red Sox came to us and asked us to be their official catch-up and condiments. And at first, I didn't take it seriously because I didn't think there was any chance that they would select us to be the official catch-up of the Red Sox or that we'd be able to afford it. But I still, like, did a sales deck. I sent them samples. And I did some phone calls with the biz dev managers that I was talking to in the front office. And next thing I know, they really wanted me to sign a contract and to come in. And I was like, well, we couldn't do it this year. It would have to be a year away. So it's like in 2019, 2021, we need time to get ready. We need time to build our product out. We couldn't pay anything up front. We would have to kind of pay any marketing fees on the back end. And they were like, yeah, yeah, no problem. We can do that. And we're going to reduce the marketing fees for you because you're a startup. They gave me a lot of reasons not to say no. And it kind of just convinced me. And so it was like one of those things where... The rational person says, do not do this. This is insane. You are a small company. We were like $1 million in sales at the time. And we were like, there is no way you should be able to handle that. And the other, the entrepreneur is like, this is it. We made it. This is going to be huge. And so you're like at odds with yourself. And I did the financial models on it and stuff like that. Looked at the money and like the return on the marketing and stuff. So I had some rational backup to this and. 
even though you can really sway those things if you are a little bit too optimistic. So be careful. But some people on my board were a little hesitant, as they should have been. But we ended up doing it. And then right after we announced the Red Sox thing, as we expected, other clubs came to us and the Nationals, because I'm here in D.C., the Nationals came to us. And I thought that made sense as a really good partnership because I'm local, right? And so we did the Nats, too. And again, they were also really flexible with everything and with the payments from the cash flow standpoint. So it wasn't like I was putting a lot of money out up front. And so that helped. And so because these clubs are really flexible and they were helpful for us and they helped us make it work, we were able to do it. And I was really excited about it. And But we tapped into something really great. And it's been nerve wracking because it's been really hard. It's been a crazy year to do it, obviously, because we didn't think there was going to be a season. And then two weeks before the season started, they were like, nope, there's a season. Get everything ready. And we hadn't invested in the product yet because we were like, didn't want to put the money out if there wasn't going to be a season. And then we scrambled to do that. And then next thing you know, things were opening up faster than we thought. And Aaron Mark who runs the concessions at the Red Sox were initially predicting that they would never be at full capacity. They thought they'd be at full capacity. They thought they'd be literally at a calendar um, pop up. Remind me yesterday that yesterday was the day that Aramark thought they would be at 50% capacity in Fenway. And they've been at 100% capacity since May. So we were not ready for that. So we've been scrambling, trying to get things ready, things like that. And so it's just kind of like a test, a case. And the other thing that's nerve wracking is you have a really interesting and different product and you put it out there and all of a sudden, you know, 3 million people are trying it. And you're doing something like replacing Heinz or another standard Ken Ballpark ketchup. And these are not Whole Foods shoppers anymore that are always there. So we did get some people grumbling and pissed off that, that there's a healthy catch-up in the ballpark now. And luckily, it does not look like it's a very large amount. It seems to be a very small percentage so far from what we can tell. And the ballparks and the front offices are not upset by it at all. They're still with us, so this is good, So, which is a great test. But still, it's really hard as an entrepreneur to hear that and hear people not like your product and be mean about it and be incredibly mean about it because the 60-year-old baseball fan guy who just discovered Twitter is not the nicest person about ketchup and things like that. So you have to like take that with a stride and be ready for that too. So that was a hard part. But it was also smart and really taught us a lot about marketing and what else we need to do when we're introducing our product to a larger audience and how we need to tell our story better. And I think the big message is this key is like, when you're a startup, especially a consumer product, don't do marketing. You don't do advertising. You do storytelling. So you need to be storytelling all the time. And anything that's not telling your story doesn't help you, right? You got to be just telling why you're different, why you're better, what your story is, what the background is, making people understand who you are. And I knew that to a point. But now it really kind of drove it home. Like uh, a sign that says true made foods on it does nothing for me, right? Nobody knows what that is. So we need something that explains who we are, why we are, and creates a tactile experience perfectly. I know we're just scratching the surface of your experience and story, but Abe, I really appreciate your taking the hour with us. And for listeners at beyondtheuniform.org, in the show notes for this episode, we'll have links to everything we discuss. His online storefront is at truemadefoods.com. You can learn more there. I'll have links to his LinkedIn profile, a couple of other podcasts that he's been on as well. But Abe, thank you so much for joining Beyond the Uniform today. Justin, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Surface, surface, surface. <laughs> Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Asiri, with the help from our Chief of Staff, Steve Bain, our Editor, Lex Brown, and our Head of Social Media, Janelle Hanf. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following ways. First of all, spread the word. Beyond the Uniform has over 380 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media, at military bases, or whatever gets this resource in front of the men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second of all, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do, but just don't have nearly the resources to do it. If you know of a company that would advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them our way. Third of all, donations. If you're in a financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of our website. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find over 380 episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll also find both free and for purchase resources that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military and their families thrive in their post-military career in life.